أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين إنه خير ناصر ومعين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وخاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين. I respected elders, brothers and sisters. Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The topic of discussion that we began yesterday, but because of Allah's plan we weren't able to finish was regarding the idea of praying for the Imam of our time as a means of getting closer to him and if we look at the advice that the Imams prior to the living Imam gave to their followers when they would tell them about the Qa'im and the coming of the Savior one of the main ways that they emphasized as a means of getting close and forming a connection with him, of gaining um, uh, knowledge about him, was through reciting du'as, um, particular du'as. And in these du'as that they gave us, there's a lot of hidden um, treasures of information. If we just pay attention to it, we can learn a lot about the Imam of our time. Remember the story that I told you yesterday about the author of Mikyarul Makarim. This Sayyid, the Mujtahid, Sayyid Isfahani, Musawi Isfahani, when he sees in his dream the Imam of the time, the Imam salam, tells him to write this book about the benefits, the subject is the benefits of making dua for the Imam. That's the, that's the, the title of the book. Now that's something quite amazing, that the Imam salam, is so concerned that people should make dua that he tells somebody that, okay, no, write a book about the benefits of making du'a. We just think about that, it means that there's a lot there to be had in making these du'as. Now, today, inshallah, I'd like to spend some time with one of these du'as, which is called Dua Al-Ahad. And Dua Al-Ahad is a short du'a that you can find in many of our du'a books, including Mafatih Al-Jinan. And it's to be recited after the morning prayers. And it's one of these du'as in which we make a promise to the Imam, a pledge of loyalty and allegiance to him. And we're supposed to do it on a regular basis. And among the things mentioned about this du'a, it, when Imam Sadiq gave us this du'a, he mentioned to his companions that somebody who recites this du'a for 40 mornings, um, that person, 40 mornings straight, that person will be raised will be among the companions of the Imam when he does his dhuhr or if that person has gone into his grave, has died, then he'll be resurrected and will be allowed to join the Imam in his mission and the rewards continue, for example it's mentioned that somebody who reads this dua, 1000 sins will be forgiven from him or her now when we read these ahadith, sometimes the first instinct we have is to step back and say wait a minute, can that really be the case? We're just reading a dua every day. How can it be the case that so many good things happen to us? We become a companion of the Imam just by reading this dua. You know, like, it's just a matter of spending a few minutes every day and that, that's what can happen. The answer is that we shouldn't look at these ahadith and immediately say that, toss them out the window and say, this can't be true. No, this type of reward is in place. 
But it's for somebody who recites Dua Al-Ahad in the way that it's meant to be recited Meaning that they understand the meaning and then they apply it And for 40 days if they keep this up Then they will have formed a connection with the Imam of the time These are words from the Imam, it's the, it's the promise of the Imam Just because somebody might do this and not feel that special connection Not feel that his sins have been forgiven Doesn't mean that that type of benefit can't be reached It can be, but the Dua has to be done the way that the Imams have taught us to do Dua Now, as I mentioned, in this Dua we make a pledge to the Imam on, And we're supposed to do it on a daily basis Now this idea of, making, of, of showing loyalty on a regular basis It's something that's not just with the Imam of our time If you look at modern uh, marketing techniques that companies employ to get customers What do they do? It's not just about, they don't want you to just come once and buy some products for them No, they'll be happy if you come in once, they'll give you like a big discount If you come in once, but then the key thing is they want your email address And they want you to text them and they want your, your, your cell phone number So that they keep on sending you messages So that you come back again, again and again and again And the key thing is that they want to develop loyalty They want you to become a loyal customer Because uh, you know, a, a customer who spends a lot in one day but never comes back isn't that worthwhile to them But a customer who comes in you know, regularly and spends an average amount every time he comes in That's a customer that's valuable So they do everything they can to get your loyalty, they brand their products, whatever it is To make sure that you're gonna come back again and again Because that's the way human beings are, when human beings form a loyalty to something That's when you know, they're, that they're, they're pulled in by that thing They're captured by it It's hard for them to then break that loyalty They won't just leave it aside easily So what I'm saying is that companies have taken advantage of this trait in human beings To form loyalty to things And they want, they want to do it for the purpose of money But it's something that we ought to be attaching our, We should be attaching our loyalty to things that actually count And to things that, that will make a difference for us so by the Imam Ali Salam telling us that we should do this dua every morning on a regular basis He's saying that you know what One thing that you can become loyal to One thing that you can keep on coming back to again and again and again Is your, the Imam of your time On a regular basis be somebody who remembers the Imam Now this dua I want to just quote a few lines from the dua Because it's important that we understand The deeper message behind it If somebody just goes and reads it without having an understanding of where it's coming from They might wonder, you know, like, okay, so what's the, what's the big deal? But if we try to pause and ponder on some of the lines from it I think we'll see that, you know, how profound this dua is Peace be salawat ala Muhammad wa In this dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We first begin by praising Allah We say that the Imam alayhi salam teaches us that we first talk to Allah We say, Allahumma rabban nur al-azim O Allah, the Lord of the great light and the Lord of the, of the chair which is elevated And the Lord of the seas which boil And the one who sent down the Torah And the Bible and the Psalms Now you might wonder, okay, we're making a dua to, the, for the, to, to pledge our allegiance to the Imam Why are we starting out by remembering Allah And remembering His qualities? What's the connection here? And the connection is actually very beautiful, it's very profound Because first we remind ourselves in this dua, we remind ourselves of how we came to this idea of an imam We first remind ourselves that wait, okay there is a God And that God is not just khaliq Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just the khaliq, Allah is also rab as well Rab is some, is, when, we read, when we read the Quran we should understand that rab means something other than just a creator Rabb is somebody who not only creates but also manages the affairs So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Rabb And He has His great light And He's the one who's, who is in charge of the universe he, These seas which boil He's the one who keeps them churning And He's the one who sent out these holy books of guidance The Torah and the Injil And He's also the one who sent out the Quran as well Now given that's the case Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even now, in this time period, here and now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should still be our Rabb as well And so we remind ourselves, we say Ya Hayyan Qabla Kulli Hayy O the one who is 
alive before everything else was alive or the one who is alive after everything that, that else is alive or the one who brings life to the dead and who brings dead to the live, the, the living or the living, there's no God but He we remind ourselves that Allah SWT is living that means that He is the one who is responsible for giving us life and now how is He going to give us life? Right? later on in the dua the Imam is going to say that to the Imam, he's going to say you're the one who's going to come and bring life to the hearts of the servants so you see the connection here that Allah SWT is the one who gives life and life, where's that life going to come? The Imam's job is to give life to the servants Meaning that hearts which are dead That spirituality that we're looking for It's in the person of the Imam now that's a, It's a very profound concept just captured in these few words of this dua right here Sometimes you know, we're in the age, brothers and sisters, of, of where people are looking for spirituality And they're looking to try all these new types of things right? They're like, okay, what, what can we do to, to get away from you know, this material world that we're in? Because they've been there, they've tried it, and they've realized that, you know what, this doesn't give us satisfaction. You know, we've, there was a time when, you know, literally, not literally, but it was as if money was growing from trees. Right? Back in, there was a time when the economy was doing well. Like, there, was, there actually was, believe it or not, there was a time when the economy was doing well, people were doing well. And people were living the life. But despite having all the riches at hand, they weren't happy. And now with the economic downturn, people are asking, what can we turn to? Where can we find our happiness and solace? So they look to all sorts of different things, different types of music, different types of, I don't know, dancing, different types of like new age type of ideologies. Sometimes we forget what do we have right here in the heritage of the Ahlul Bayt and Muslim. Such profound teachings in the form of these simple things that we have to do. What's the requirement? Just make, take, make wudu, go and talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with these du'as. Now, in this dua, after we praise Allah, then we remember the Imam. We ask Allah to convey our salams to the Imam. But we don't just do it on behalf of ourselves. We say, oh Allah, convey him our salams on behalf of all the mu'mineen and all the mu'minat. Whether they, wherever they be on the earth, in the east and the west, whether they be um, on the plains or on the mountains, whether they be on land or on sea, all of them... I want them to be part of my sending salams to the Imam. And I also want my parents to be there as well too. وَعَنِّي وَعَنْ وَالِدَيْ On behalf of me and my parents. Now what this teaches us is that when it comes to connecting to the Imam of our time, we shouldn't be selfish about it. It's something that we have to try to take others along as well too. Right? Everyone needs the Imam. Some people don't realize it. They don't realize that they need that connection with the Imam But if we do and we're making this dua Then we should include them as well too So that if there is a response If there's any benefit from this dua Inshallah they will get the thawab of it as well too They'll partake in that spiritual experience as well too Just by our mentioning them as well Now I want to quote a hadith here from Actually this is from the Imam of the time you know, I mentioned before that the Imam was, has, has in the time period of his occultation The ghayba from time to time, he corresponds with some of the pious individuals. And one of these individuals is Shaykh Al-Mufid. In one of the letters that he writes to Shaykh Mufid, he tells us um, one of the ways that we can end the ghayba and make his reappearance come faster. What does he say? He says that if, if only our Shias would come together with united hearts, number one, Number two, in order to fulfill their pledge and their promise to us. So they come together with united hearts and to get to united and fulfilling the pledge. That blessing that they're looking for of meeting us and being with us, meaning the Imam, that would not be delayed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would hasten the, um, the promised deliverance and they would be able to see us uh, with the true knowledge of who we are. So the Imam al is saying that there's two ingredients that need to be in place in order for the dhuhr to come, which is unity and fulfilling the pledge, keeping the promise. So in this dua right here, we're exactly doing that. We're saying, okay, to the Imam, we're here, we're committing ourselves, we're showing our loyalty, allegiance, and we're doing it with everyone else too. Okay, now, 
What is it that we're pledging allegiance to the Imam? What is it that we're promising to him? We say, Allahumma j'alni min ansarihi wa a'wanihi O oh Allah, make me from among his helpers and from among his ansar and a'wan meaning is his close helpers and even if I'm not there then at least the ones who are his assistants I want to be part of that movement the ones who come and, and, and come around him the ones who, who hurry to meet any need that he has any need that he has I want to be the one who fulfills his need and I want to be among those who follow his commands and protect him and I want to be among those who die in his way as well all these, all these things are part of the pledge that we're making to the Imam and then we say something very beautiful we look, to the, we look at our lives we say that oh Allah if it's the case that I die before the Imam comes this is a very beautiful line from the dua Allahumma in hala bayni wa bayna maut is that going to be the biggest concern that I have? like the fact that I'm going to die? no the biggest concern is how am I going to die? am I going to be in a die, die am I going to die in a state where I'm prepared and ready for the coming of the Imam? that's important because we say to Allah oh Allah if it so if it just so happens that in your wisdom I die before the coming of the Imam then in that case فَأَخْرِجْنِي مِنْ قَبْرِ مُؤْتَزِرًا كَفْنِي then when the Imam does make his duhur take me out of my grave in a state that my, my kafan, my funeral shroud is wrapped over me and my sword is unsheathed and the spear is in my hand and I am saying labbaik, labbaik to the Imam of the time now imagine somebody who is reading this dua what the, this, it's a reminder number one that we're going to die okay, sometimes we need to remind ourselves that we have to that you know, our life is, is short, we're going to die but second of all it reminds us that you know what's important is that let's at least be on that right path okay, we're not asked to like all of us aren't asked to be like Ayatollah Bahjads. All of us aren't asked to be Salman e Farsi. But the important thing is that we should be trying to be on that path. So that if it's the case that God takes us our lives, then we can tell Allah, well, we did our best. You know, we were on that path. Had we had the time and the resource and opportunity, we would have gotten, inshallah, to even those to that level even higher than that as well, too. We'd say salawat ala Muhammad. The dua continues. And now we look at the world around us. We say, Oh Allah, when we're looking around us, we're seeing all this corruption and all these problems that are happening. Like look, to, look at right now our situation. Those of you who are following the news, like, I mean, it's incredible, right? These riots that are happening in London. Who would have thought in a civilized country like that with such a good you know, um, law and security and police and all that that you would have rioters taking over the streets like is this London or is it some third world country right, what's going on the chaos that's going on we pay attention to that and we, we remember the imam with respect to that chaos we say Allahumma we say wa amurullahumma bihi biladak oh Allah by means of the imam make the the towns and the cities and the lands come to life again and then make the hearts of your servants come to life as well. فَإِنَّكَ قُلْتَ وَقَوْلُكَ الْحَقُ ظَهَرَ الْفَسَادُ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِ النَّاسِ Because you have said in the Qur'an that the reason for all this corruption in the land, all these problems, is because of the people's own, action, own, own actions. When, we, when we, we remind ourselves of this, we say that, Oh Allah, we recognize that it's not a random thing that we're having problems in this, in this world. It's not the case that we're left alone in this world to do whatever we want with it. No. All these problems that we're facing are because of our own actions. In a, in, in a global scale. People, when they turn away from God, God afflicts them with trials. Right? Difficulties. So that in the hope that they'll come back to God. It's a very simple pattern that's in place in this world. So when you see that the world is crumbling around us, the cause of it is very clear mention, it's very clearly mentioned in the Quran it's because of people turning away from God so I as a believer I'm not going to become distraught when I see this I'm not going to become depressed right? I'm going to become filled with faith and hope this dua is about giving us hope that the imam being there it's all under control you know, this is something that's accounted for and there is somebody in charge who's looking over this and then, and then we turn to like our desire and our hope. We say that Allahumma arini tal'ata al-rashida wal ghurrata al-hamida. We say, Oh Allah, I want to see the Imam of my time. Right? I'm sad that I can't see him. 
It's the deprivation of something that I'd like to have. In history, it's never been in the case. Throughout centuries of humanity existing, there's never been a situation like this where for such a, pro such a prolonged time, people have not been able to look upon the insan al kamil that perfect being. For, throughout history, people who wanted to, they could find him. Look at Salman al Farsi, the story of Salman. He was in, in Persia, but he had this desire to see the perfect human being of his time. And so his travels took him from one place to another in search of that being, and finally, he finds him. And when he finds him, he falls to his feet. He's so happy that he found the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet in his kindness and mercy, he picks him up and lifts him up. He says, no, this is not our custom. We don't, we don't, we don't prostrate to anybody but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we not having access to be able to see the Imam, that's something that pains me. I tell Allah that in, in the dua right here. Oh Allah, let me see him. Let me know him. You know, end this separation and take away this barrier from, that separates me from him. Brothers and sisters, these are some of the themes that we have in this dua. Again, this dua is about renewing our pledge to the Imam. It's about being united and bringing along all the other mu'minin and mu'minat along with in our dua. Keeping our promise is something that is very, imp it's very important to the Imam. One of the individuals um, that we know that the Imam al-Islam had special attention to in the city of Najaf, this was some time back in a previous generation, was somebody who was very good at keeping his promises. The story goes like this. There was one time this one individual who through these esoteric sciences was able to find out the location of the Imam. There's some sciences that you can do to find out some information which is hidden from the rest of the people. Basically through some calculations and special means, he found out where the Imam is located. And so he goes to see the Imam and he sees that the Imam of the time is talking with a locksmith. And he speaks with him and then the Imam is walking away. This individual, he goes and hurries up and he greets the Imam. And Imam al Islam says that, oh, okay, so you found out where I am? So he says, yeah. The Imam tells him that, look, if you wish for to, have, to be in my company, and if you wish for me to come after you, then go and try to be like this locksmith. So this man, this man says, okay, fine. He bids farewell to the Imam. And he goes to this locksmith and he tries to find out, okay, what was it about this locksmith that made the Imam go to him? Like the Imam would in, himself initiate the visit. He spends some time with him and he realizes that there's one characteristic that this man has that distinguishes him. That is the reason why. And he asks him, he says that that man who just walked by, do you know who he is? He says, yeah, his name is Muhammad and his father is Marhum Hassan. But he doesn't realize like which person this is and who his father was. He just knows that he's a, a good man. He didn't realize who, that the Imam of the time was visiting him. What was this characteristic that he had? He sees that whenever he makes a promise to somebody to fix their locks, he never breaks that promise. No matter what, when he gives the time, that lock is ready. We saw a similar story, if you remember, a few days back with that man who was mending the shoes, the kafashi. The same characteristic. It tells us something, my brothers and sisters, that when you make a promise, we should fulfill it. Now here, when we're making a promise to the Imam of the time to be like him, to take his commands and to put them into practice in our lives, then if we want to have that connection with him, we should be similarly diligent about our, the promise that we're making. Let me go back to that story that I was saying yesterday, inshallah, this time I'll get the tawfiq to finish it. And you can see how the Imam is sensitive about this, about making sure we keep to our promises. There's a promise that we make when we get married to our spouse, to Allah actually, to take our spouse and to treat them with the best way possible. There's a promise we make to Allah when we have children to raise them to be the best possible and to be the best to them. The story goes, again let me repeat the introduction inshallah we're going to finish it this time, that one of our great scholars, 
Ayatollah Hassan Zade Amudi, when in his young days, he had a teacher, Sayyid Hassan Ilahi, who was a very great scholar, who had reached very high levels of perfection and spirituality, and he had access to the Imam of the time. So he tells him that, okay, I want to meet the Imam, please make an introduction for me. Let me also participate in these gatherings. Sayyid Hassan promises, he says, the next time I meet him, I'll tell him. They separate, and it so happens that Ayatollah Hassan Zade goes to his hometown of Amwal. And there one day, it's a hot day, and he's tired, he's resting in the afternoon, but the kids are making noise, so he gets up and he starts getting angry at them. And he gets angry at his wife as well too. And they're just being kids, right? After all, kids are kids. But he thinks that, okay, his sleep is there, he needs to, you know, get his rest, so he gets angry. And then he tries to go back to sleep again, but then he realizes that, wait a minute, that wasn't appropriate. I shouldn't have gotten angry about it. It's one thing to inform somebody, but to get angry about somebody without there being a cause, especially a believer, it's something which is a sin. It decreases in our spirituality. It takes us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, he feels his conscience is bothering him. He goes to the market and he buys some sweets and some fruits as gifts. He brings them home, gives it to his children and his, fam- his wife. But still, he still feels that there's something wrong, there's something missing. That anger, the, that fire of hell that comes in when somebody gets angry had entered him. The effect of it still hadn't left him. And he didn't know what to do. So thereafter, he journeys. He goes all the way from his hometown to see his teacher who's in Tabriz at that time, which is far away. So after a, a, a long journey, he meets his teacher and he wants to tell, tell him about this problem and ask him the solution to the problem. His teacher tells him, be, before he tells him about the problem, actually he asks him, he says that, 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 that request that I had from you, you know, I told you that set up a meeting with me and the Imam, did you act on that? You know, any, any news from the Imam? So he tells him that actually I wanted, I, I, I wrote a letter and I was, I, I've given it, that letter to somebody to give to you. I already wrote that letter, but let me just tell you what is in that letter. Actually, Sayyid Hassan tells Ayatul Hassan Zadeh, actually I talked to the Imam of the time. I put your request forward. And the Imam Salam, when he heard that from me, he cast his head down for a bit and he was in deep thought. And then he spoke. Let me tell you what he said. He told me that how does he possibly think that he is going to be able to traverse this path of perfection with that type of behavior when he's being angry and having a short temper with his wife and his children. With fighting like that with him, how can he possibly get to this station where he can be in my company? So this is the message that the Imam has for Ayatollah Hassan Zadeh Amali. Ayatollah Hassan Zadeh realizes that without him even telling his teacher the problem, the problem was solved for him. So he goes back home and from then on he reforms himself. And then when he's telling this story to his students many years later after he's become, like I said, one of the orafa of the time, he says that don't think that this path of getting to be with the Imam is something easy. No, it has its twists and its turns, its challenges, obstacles. But the important thing is to persevere, to always be aware that we're in the presence of Allah and to watch ourselves. If we have that sense of awareness, that sense of watchfulness, inshallah we will reach our desired goal of being in the company of the Imam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.